Okay, so we are officially recording and then I'm gonna go and head into Facebook. Hopefully it'll cooperate with us and we'll get everything rolling here soon. Okay. All right, so it is preparing the streaming and then we should be able to go live after that. I just put the title in here and then we go live. Okay, so we should be officially live. Let's see, yeah, so we should be in the group now. I'm just gonna do a check and I'm, gonna, I'm going to see if you all are already inside this group and seeing this video, let us know, say hi, and tell us where you're from so we know. I feel like a radio um, personality. Yeah, know. You know, tell us where you're from and we'll see where you are. So let's just see if it's popping up, making sure. Um, Yes, we are live and there are 10 people. We apologize, we had a little bit of technical difficulties, which does happen from time to time, but we are live. We have got some great experts here today. I'm super excited to be interviewing Tamara, uh, sorry, I was gonna get this wrong, Tamara Rial and Trista Zinn, and they are both um, high propressives and low pressure fitness um, experts, extraordinaires on this topic. And we know there's a lot of interest in this topic, my name is Tracy Sher. I'm a pelvic physical therapist um, and CEO and founder of Pelvic Guru, for some of you that don't know who I am. And let's do this. I've been excited to talk about this, the basics of hypopressives and all of that. But before we jump in, I'm going to have you just introduce yourselves and explain your experience with this or your passion about it. So go ahead, Tamara, I'm going to have you go first. Well, thank you very much, Tracy, and thank you for... Um, during this meeting, we're very excited, both Trista and me, to be here and share a little bit about low pressure fitness and also hyperpress as well. I'm the founder and developer of low pressure fitness training, and I've been a with I've been working with hyperpressive since since ten or twelve years ago, and and leading a little bit this hyperpressive movement. Uh, we began in Spain and then now throughout the world and, and now I live here in the United States. So we're beginning to work and to let people know about this in the United States also. Excellent. Yeah, I think that's part of um, what's happening is that there is a lot of research and information in other languages. So it's been hard for some people to follow. So it's great that it's now finally coming more to the U.S. to even at least have us understand what's what's happening and experience that, and see more more research written in English. So that will be that will be a great addition too. Okay, thank you so much, and Trista. Hi. So I am a personal trainer. I got into interested into the technique for personal reasons. Um, actually, in about 2012. And it was due to my personal success with the technique that sort of brought me forward and uh, yes, yeah, started my whirlwind, I guess, of travel back and forth to Spain so I could become Canada's director and master trainer and international course instructor. And I can only help others by teaching others to work with their clients and patients. So that's uh, how I came into the exercise technique and I met Tamara through the process and she's my mentor and yeah, <laughs> she helps me. <laughs> and I will say just from um, stories, people cannot say en enough great things about you, Tamara. They're always saying what an, a fantastic instructor you are and how much you bring 
to a course when you teach it. So you have a lot of um, accolades, teaching accolades. So thank you so much for that. And this is one of our reasons why we decided to host it this year. There was a, um, I'm not gonna lie, there was a curiosity about it. Mm -hmm. We wanted to know what hyperpressives actually are and wanted to experience it. But then also we were looking at who is the best instructor for this and it became clear that um, you were the right person um, and everyone was saying well, how excellent your courses are. So mm -hmm. we are gonna drop some information in the box about, um, just information about our Orlando course and then our Portland course and where you can get certification this year. We're only doing it two times this year. So we are gonna share that information as well. Um, okay, so I'm gonna do this. I'm going to share my screen for better or worse. Let's see what happens. Uh, but there are two videos here. Um, let's see if I can find them. Yep, this is the first one. So let's do this. Let me pull this up. You never know what's gonna happen in live. <laughs> All right. All right. This is what people see, okay? This is in another language, of course, but this is Tamara right here. Okay, so this is what people see um, and, and may um, wonder about, or, or, you know, they just see this kind of, the, the, the belly going in and the belly coming up. Mm -hmm. So this is, again, from a consumer perspective, this is what we see. Um, so I'm not going to let you share too much yet. Um, to We're going to keep the suspense here. And then I'm going to actually show this one, too. This is, uh, this is a video from Trista's, um, with someone with Trista here. And I'm going to show you that, too. I believe there's a volume. Hopefully you all can hear that. So we're going to um, start in not a great position, and then we'll change, and then you can see what happens as he's getting into proper posture. So take another breath if you want, and inhale. Good. So now if I have his feet facing forward, yeah, I have him go tall up this way, lengthen. Yeah, I get him to put serratus on and open up in through here and go more. Yeah. Now you can see what happens. Far more effective. Okay, so when people say, oh, yes, yes, I do hypopressives, I know the apnea, yeah, whatever, it's not just a breathing technique, it relies heavily on the postures and poses which is a perfect example of why we do it with the pose. So you go again, he's nice and open, growing, knees are slightly bent. Yep, he has access to the forward. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Grow. Yes. Much deeper abdominal activation and much better back. Yeah. Awesome. So that was, I think, helpful just to see what, in fact, it is and um, what we're seeing. But again, from a person on purpose, I said, I'm going to keep my curiosity. I've not taken this course, nor do I know a lot about it yet. I, I obviously look and see what a consumer would see. But so what I'm curious about is what is, tomorrow? what is hypopressive? So when you see that, what's happening and what is it? What's going on there? Well, first we have to see the etymology of the word because hypo means less and pressive means pressure. So it's, it's a name of an exercise which whole, a whole thought or whole purpose is to do exercise decreasing pressure. So uh, that's also the reason why we call it low pressure fitness. It's a way of training the body with pressure. So what we are seeing that there is a, is a breathing technique, specifically when you open the rib cage and, and we were seeing the two men with, with the abdominal vacuum and, and it's so impressive. So normally when people see um, a video or a photo, the first thing they notice is the abdominal draw in. So that's why some people call it also abdominal hyperpressives because they think it's something that is for the abdomen or it's for the breathing, but in reality, it's a, um, it's a whole postural and breathing technique that includes or not that, that breathing. So that's a good point because people think that 
if you're not doing the abdominal drawing, you're not doing hot presses. But in reality, as a specific, there are specific exercises or poses that are done in a, ryth a rhythmic pattern. Like for example, we have the yoga method or the Pilates, the Pilates method that has a diff different exercises that go throughout a whole session or class. In, and have different specific breathing. So in, in, in the case of hyperpressors, the most noticeable thing is the abdominal vacuum. So that abdominal vacuum, and I think now I'm gonna talk about another question that many people ask us, is it's similar or not to the Udiyana Banda of yoga? And that's, and that's great because really the abdominal vacuum or Udiyana Banda or Pranayama breathing of yoga and that includes the block of the diaphragm. They call it a, a block or a banda of the of the diaphragm. Is really the technique that we use in hyperpressives. So in that case, we are using a pranayama or a specific breathing technique a, in conjunction with a specific a, exercise and in, in postural and other breathing exercises. So. Um, if we look back uh, from a historical point of view, this breathing technique has almost existed since, since we are animals that move, no? Uh, the children, if we look at a child, a little child almost does that sucking in and they look, look, look my ribs. And, and in yoga, uh, they know very well this technique and how to perform it. And also in fitness and bodybuilding, we could see Arnold Schwarzenegger do this breathing technique, uh, which they call it abdominal vacuum. The purposes and the different methods are different because Arnold did it from an aesthetics point of view or for, or for competition. In yoga, they, they have another purposes. And, and in the hypopressive technique or in the hypopressive exercise training, uh, there is there is specific part particular particularities, but um, but there is a common thing that is that breathing, and and also uh, that's what many people ask. But I I, I would like to uh, point out that it's not as as I think Trista put put in the video. It's not only about breathing, because one thing that I see. And it is a little bit of a, a confusion that people have. And I've seen this a lot in many videos. And sometimes a, people learn from a YouTube video, or learn from reading a, an article or whatever, that they think that hyperpressives are just abdominal vacuum. Right. And, th and this is a big misunderstanding of the whole technique because it's like thinking that Pilates is doing the hundreds, for example, or is doing lateral costal breathing. Well, <laughs> I think Pilates is much more than that, but it's one of the, um, the, the principles. So I could say that the, the breathing is one of the main principles of the technique, but it's not the only one. And maybe, and maybe some confusion that has been around for so many years is that of it's only about breathing and sucking in. And when you suck in, this is important. You're not, you're not doing a, an abdominal hollowing or you're not doing a bracy because people say, look, look, look how I open ribs and, and they just contract their abdomen. And right. I've seen- If I do, if I wear a bathing suit, I'm, I think I'm doing the best hypopressive, but probably not. <laughs> <laughs> right, but, but, <laughs> But that's, that's trying to do it. And, and I, I like this thing that one of my coaches to, told me yesterday, we were talking and she said, the beauty of, of low pressure fitness and, and hyperpressives is that, is that it's a, a very difficult technique to acquire. It, it, it takes years and years of practice and we know it because we've been practicing it, or practicing it, it ourselves. And you have to master the technique. So because it's difficult, it, 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 it is also difficult to, to learn it correctly. And it's easy to make mistakes and to misunderstand. 
So I also think that those techniques that have a mastery of, of working out and body awareness and a lot of a body, body control, um, also, also bring in a long-term great, great success in a, per, in a personal way, especially. Yeah, I appreciate you pointing that out because you're right. I think everyone looks at hypopressive as that one exercise. And I never thought, just to go back to what you were saying earlier, I didn't realize that there's, you know, we know we have a two-day course and you're going to be showing us all different things in the course but I don't think I knew the breadth of it or the amount that you, it's, it's a full set. It sounds like a full set of different exercises you do that comprise of hypopressives. Is that correct? Right, right. And that's why we like to call it a low pressure a fitness training system because as a whole training, we use a hypopressive technique a, as one cherry on the cake. Awesome. And so this begs the question, and I'll, I'll have both of you answer this because I think this is important from, I know Trista from a personal experience and when you train as well. Um, so if we know now that there's this whole low pressure fitness is a, a system of different exercises you do, what are the proposed benefits? And this is where I want to, I want to preface all this by saying that I'm fully aware and I've talked to many people about this and we've had many conversations about this, that there's still, we wish there was more research that um, there is a lot of research out there, but there's some issues with some of the research. So sometimes the proposed benefits, you're seeing this anecdotally and we're seeing it in some research, but it's not necessarily um, a home run with research just yet, right? Is this fair to say? Yeah, right, that's very fair to say, of course. So um, when some people say, well, no, you shouldn't do it, or you shouldn't even look at it, I think that there's two sides we can look at this. And we're not just saying, hey, it's this little tool in your toolbox. We're saying, this is just like you're saying, if there's Pilates or yoga, it's ways to incorporate things um, that may be helpful for some people in some cases. And so it's a way of learning. It's a, it's a system of a way of learning these different exercises. So the question is, as I toss this out to you gently, um, what are the proposed benefits or what do you see that people gain from this versus just doing a pelvic floor exercise or Pilates or yoga or, or are they similar? What, I would love to know that. I think a lot of people would like to know that. And by the way, we would love to see questions too because I'm looking at you guys and I'm seeing your questions. People are coming from all over. We have, I see Victoria, BC, Philly, um, all over. So um, let us know if you have questions too, and I'll look out for that. Okay. If Trista, whenever you want to interrupt me, just, just say, because you know, <laughs> <laughs> Trista's English is much better than mine, okay? <laughs> so, um, well, I, because Tracy asked me, I'm going to be, begin, but please interrupt me. Um, well, I'm going to tell you that I was the first skeptical of, of hyperpressives because I was like, no way. And this was when it was when nobody even knew about this. And I said, no way this could, this could, this could work. Like, how can that work? And I had the same view from a consumer perspective. And that's the reason that led me to do my, my doctoral dissertation and, and my PhD and then do all the research. So what I want, I, I first did in my first study is compare Pilates to, to hyperpressives and we, we assess several, several uh, outcomes, like for example, lumbar pain and, and symptoms of urinary leakage and all that. And, and the, the study was going on and I saw that the people were dropping from the Pilates group and, and then the girls that were doing the hyperpressives were coming after the class and saying, oh, you know, I really love it, and I felt this, and I felt I felt um, a great improvement in my symptoms of especially air for and content. And they were just telling you, and I was surprised. Like this cannot be possible. <laughs> this is not what I what I was supposed. And 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 that's why I fall in love with it finally over over time because I began to realize that first people were telling me how they were feeling. And, and then after that, I begin to do a little bit more of research on those things that especially, especially people pointed out. So the first thing that people talked about is those pelvic issues that are more related with pressure management, especially a for urinary incontinence and, and prolapse. And, and, and those were the first things I began to hear, but not the only ones. Then another thing that struck me was the 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 the, 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 the um, 
when people began talking about their improvement in, in low back pain, which I never thought about it, but then researching, okay, I begin to see the the relationship be, between the core, the also, also pressure management, and also the relationship between the deep core muscles and lumbar spine and back pain. Well, so so I said, oh my God, the, how can it be possible? And after that, more things like, for example, the they were after class, they felt, okay, I feel less anxious. And I began thinking, I began associating all the breathing pattern and the, the relaxation techniques that, that we use in the systematic breathing and the low pressure breathing, that means stop breathing. The, the idea of I stop breathing, so I stop my mind, the mindfulness of the practice. And then I thought, oh my God, so they, so, that's why the people are telling me so so many things I never realized about anxiety. So those were the first thing, and it was it was it was a little bit like a Tristas as a personal success story. And then after that, many physiotherapists because the the people who begin to work more with with hyperpressive in my technique were probably PTs especially. So I think that's the reason why it, it, it become more popular in, in the pelvic world because the pelvic PTs treat women's more women's issues, and that's the reason why I think it got so popular in this um, for especially a urinary incontinence, prolapse, diastasis, and core core functionality, whatever. So, but that was the reason. But we cannot we cannot uh, forget. That it's not it's not only um, a method that can be trained by women because as we saw in the videos that it was two men practicing so this is not only for women it's for men and and it's not only not it's not only done to re a, for women okay I want to recover no it's just exercise and we need to exercise and exercise is the best medicine we have. So I think that's important because also what is misleading is that people think it's only a postnatal or it's only a, a pelvic floor exercise. No, it, 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 can, it can be an exercise, a friendly pelvic floor exercise that, that, this, that this type of population can practice as a type of a healthy, friendly exercise for for pelvic issues, but a, really what it is, is an exercise program. Yeah, yeah, and I think the, the one thing that um, happens too with a lot of clients is they come to you for one goal, they have one goal in mind, but usually the reason for that goal is because a variety of different things sort of snowballed out of place, right? So if they come to you for pelvic reasons, but I stand back and I take a look at the full body approaches to, hmm, why is there pelvic floor? Why do they have symptoms? When we start to use the technique with the breathing and the postures and the poses, as the pelvic floor starts to restore itself and they start reducing symptoms there, we start to get the positive cascade of things also happening because we're also restoring respiratory function. Because if we're doing the diaphragmatic breathing, we're looking at the breath. So if you res um, restore someone's breathing patterns, enable them to breathe better, that in itself, again, that's digestion, circulation, it's a whole mental energy changes, but we don't just look at that core canister, we're looking at everything from head to toe. So then they start, like Tamara was saying, they don't have the low back pressure, they're noticed they're able to sit longer, they're able to stand longer, they're family members are noticing a change in their posture. Something's different, but they can't figure out what. And I think all those little things that um, a therapist might look at, oh, why is this causing, why are they getting this symptom of pelvic floor dysfunction? Or why are they getting the symptom of the back pain or um, restricted breathing? We know now that it's, we're not just looking at the one piece. The therapists are trying to take more of a full body approach. And when you take this full body approach, then you start to see positive things start to, uh, well, they unwound into a, maybe a negative spiral, if you know what I mean. And then things start to spiral into a positive. 
And like Tamara commented, it's an exercise program that's, um, well, it's a maintenance program. So we never claim to say you are healed. All you need to do is do this for a certain period of time, 12 weeks, and you are good to go. No. I like to say it's like brushing our teeth or doing cardiovascular exercise. We need to do it on a regular basis to maintain our dental health, our cardiovascular health. So this is just an exercise program that maintains our core respiratory function, postural function, and everyone's maintenance program is different depending on what their lifestyles are. And you, like I say, it could be, uh, for me it was, a couple of my pelvic floors started to normalize. I started to feel a difference there, but it wasn't until, I guess, a car, a long car ride a month or two later that my husband commented on, do you notice that you're sitting still for the first, because I always had piriformis. I was on, I was on a ball, my fist, trying to like, I could never get comfortable in a car. And so you're kind of like, oh my God, I've been sitting here for two hours with no problems, but I didn't notice I wasn't rolling on a ball anymore because I wasn't needing to roll on it anymore. Do you know what I mean? So there's all these positive things that start to happen that you maybe not notice right away, you know, because you didn't really go into it with those goals in mind. But the, yeah, anyway, you know what I'm saying. Awesome. So. <laughs> so we have a bunch of questions. I'm hoping we can, I'm hoping we can get to a lot of these because they're really good. Um, I'm gonna start with Kim Vopney, the China coach. We're going to look at... Um, Say hello. Hello, Kim. Um, from Canada. But let me see. I thought there were two questions. Here. Ah, one of them is, why is the wrist and arm and ankle position important? How does it change the apnea? So why ah, are you doing that? that, that that's a great question. Well, the, the arm positioning, uh, there is one principle, tec technical postural principle in, in the method that is called the shoulder girdle activation. And that is also common in many other methods. Uh, so the idea here is mainly for two purposes. One is to create a myofascial uh, uh, activation and lengthening throughout the activation of the, of the shoulder girdle muscles. So that's why, for example, when you put, you, you put an internal position in the arms, what you're really doing if you're activating your shoulder muscles, your triceps, your dorsal lats, and it also helps and enables to activate better the serratus because we do an abduction of the, um, uh, the scapula. So that will help us a lot to activate the lats and the activation of the lats in conjunction with the serratus. Because if I tell you right now sitting, Tracy, and everybody who's telling us, okay, activate your serratus. That's quite difficult, right? And especially for beginners. So we have to facilitate that. So whenever we're activating the serratus, what we're also helping is to widen the rib cage, to widen the rib cage and to have more proprioception of the breathing muscles. One of the principal muscles that is gonna help us uh, open the rib cage when we're doing the abdominal vacuum is gonna be the anterior serratus, one of the most forgotten muscles. And so really, they, everything has a purpose. Even when we do the feet, there, sometimes I, when you're teaching classes and people get tired, ah, oh, why do I have to put the, the, why do I have to do the ankle dorsiflexion? And we all know in the pelvic world, especially because this has been researched, that whenever you do a, an ankle dorsiflexion, there is a, activation of the core muscles, the transverse activates. And you can say, why, why is this? Because of the, of the connection of the myofascial chain. And so in the, in the, the uh, connection of the brain, you can see that light up too. It's right, like, right. So it's fascinating as how you go from the toes and you connect from the, from the head and also going from the bottom, we can also do it from, from the top. So, when you're doing the positioning, everything is active. It's not like you relax and open ribs and that's all. No, the, the, the arms have to be really, really active. And that's one of the most difficult things to get that, that principle of the shoulder girdle activation. But in the up, in, from a different opposite um, 
in opposition to normally what you do in, in other techniques that you stabilize, what we do, we stabilize the shoulders, but at the same time, we stabilize them and we open and lengthen. So the idea is opening the chest, lengthening with your arms, abducting, doing a great abduction of your, of your scapula and activating every little muscle you have in your arms, your chest, your back to go from, from the middle to, to the outside, no? Inside, outside. Yeah, so I say when I, te when I teach the courses or teach the clients, I give them examples that every action creates a reaction, right? So with all the little details and the cues to the poses, they create a reaction and it's really nice for them to be able to feel the difference between, oh, what happens when you grow compared to when you're not growing? What happens when you grow? What happens when you do the shoulder activation compared to when you're not? So then they feel the difference and how that little action just created a reaction somewhere else, whether it's in within their core, their pelvic floor, or what have you. So then it kind of hits home a little bit more as to why there are these specific details within the, the postures and the poses. Um, can you still hear me? I changed something with my microphone. Are you? Yeah. Able to okay, good. Um, great. So, um, so one of the questions I think that people are still asking, which I know is hard now that I'm understanding there's a variety of these poses you're talking about and positions and things you do. Um, Kelsey asked, hi, Kelsey said, um, can you explain a little bit more about what is going on mechanically and how this improves function? So what is it mechanically that you're doing in these that is improving function? And, and some, I guess the overall thing would be you're doing a form of exercise or movement, right? Mm -hmm. And activation is that, but is there more to it mechanically that's different with hypopressives? Well, that's a difficult question because <laughs> that's, that's fundamental physiology. If you want the research basics, there's, there hasn't been really like a physiological, a deep, research done on what happens when when you're doing when you're doing low pressure so if there there has been some studies that have highlighted what happens in the specific muscles but the whole picture we still don't know it and i think that will take a lot of time and i hope i hope that comes even to see from from an, a from a neural perspective and a cognitive perspective what's going on with you when you stop breathing like because really is especially with the abdominal vacuum what happens is that you stop you stop breathing you really you're really breath holding you're doing what we call a hypoxic training a, or or scuba diving <laughs> without being under the water but you're, you're telling your body that you're inhaling. So this is curious. And we still, at this moment, don't know if that really creates in the, in the respiratory centers a, a different reaction mm -hmm. that also creates different reactions from, um, from a metabolic, hormonal, or neural point of view. Uh, what we know, what well, what uh, from some clinical studies I've done, especially with uh, athletes, is that we see we've seen an improvement uh, with the breath holding time. So, from a perspective of sports people who train and want to improve their um, their capacity of hypoxia or their, uh, a, or their capacity of, well, not breathing and having a physiological response, especially in, in hematologic parameters, we see clinical um, outcomes that were positive, but we still are like, I can't, we can't tell. So that's a good question. What what we what we stay uh, what we are working now is with hypotheses like everything. Yeah, so the the clinical hypothesis would would, would be a uh, one the breathing and the other the posture and other the integrating of the whole system as a unit of the exercise. So if we look at only the abdominal vacuum from a breathing perspective what theoretically happens 
and well, this, this has been studied and you can see it with ultrasounds. When, whenever you have an ultrasound, that's great because you just, you just do the technique mm -hmm. and you can see what happens in the, in the pelvic floor muscles, the abdominal muscles, and also uh, the, the, the organs, for example, the bladder. So you would see that whenever you're doing the vacuum, if it's a vacuum correctly performed, and in a stage of, of advanced learning, because in the first stages you will see nothing because <laughs> the person is just mm -hmm. learning. So you would, you would see an elevation of the bladder uh, that is due to an elevation of the diaphragm. The rib cage opening uh, and the chest lift facilitates uh, abdominal drawing it's passive, as I said, it's not active, but it's a passive abdominal drawing. So that's why you will never see an, uh, a high activation of the pelvic floor in the abdominal muscles. That will never happen. Mm -hmm. You can see a slight activation, but never a, a high uh, contraction. Uh, but there is a, a, a slight pelvic floor lift that the more time you keep on the posture, the more time you keep on the breathing and the apnea, because it's interesting to see that the more ability you have to breathe hold, the more, the more lift you will be able to achieve. And this is one thing I want to point out because sometimes people who, who has done research and they do research on people that are untrained, Mm -hmm. So we know that if you do a research on an un untrained person, on any technique that has not even gone through the learning phase, and the learning phase is first that person has to learn to do properly the technique. And, and, and I had some clients that to learn the technique, it took them six months properly. So how can you put a person, you, you teach them for 30 minutes, whatever and then you're gonna assess <laughs> nothing's gonna happen no pelvic the pelvic floor i think is gonna drop because they're, they're, they don't even know what's happening and and the same the same happens as i said with the research if the patient is not trained will not even be able to perform an adequate level of apnea and breath holding throughout a throughout time they the idea is to not do an apnea one time is to is to maintain it and maintain it and maintain it and keep a rhythm and a pattern. And, and that's gonna, that, and, and that really is, is, is what you want to assess when you, if you wanna do research. You have to assess the, the effect uh, of, that, of that systematic um, contraction or activation or elevation or whatever during, during the abdominal vacuum and the posture altogether. So, so that's one thing you see, the, the core muscles uh, and the lumbar spine muscles activate. It's a, as I said, it's a slight activation, but throughout the time, while you hold it, it increases. So it will be a temp, it will be, be more like a temporal activation instead of a, a short, short, short term activation. And, and, and then the respiratory muscles, especially the inspiratory muscles activate, but we still don't know what happens with the diaphragm. So that means, is the diaphragm, meanwhile, your rib cage, meanwhile you have the rib cage opening and, it, and it's lifted, is it contracted, slightly contracted? How is it? We still don't know. Yeah, yeah I, I, I was going to say, Tamara, I really appreciate that when you say we don't know and there's things we see but we don't know because that's so important. I think it's easy to say, quickly say, oh, hyperpressives, there's not a lot of research or this is terrible because we don't have research. But like everything else, we need to explore and we may find out that it doesn't do what you think it's doing. Yeah. But I think it's important to say what we do and don't know and mm -hmm. that it is a series of exercises and I would assume, and this leads into one of the questions, see what I'm doing here? I'm segueing into another question. <laughs> um, we'd assume like any other kind of exercise thing, there's some people that like to do CrossFit ex exercises or some that are very much Pilates based. 
some of it's just what you love to do and you're going to be consistent with, I would assume, is a large part what we know about research. Compliance and the ability to stay with a movement series, whatever that is, is something that you love to do and you feel comfortable and you feel you have a mastery over in some way or another. Um, so if it's just walking, then it's great. But if you can do this, that can be helpful as well. So one of the questions Karen Brandon, coming out of California, asks, um, she said, like most effective therapies, there are parts of the intervention that overlap and honestly can be improved with other modalities. So um, I just see part A here. I don't know if there's a part B. So what impairments is low pressure best with and which conditions is low pressure not as effective with? Do you start to see a pattern of this? It really works well with prolapse, but ah, for this, really not so much. Do you have a, yeah. Mm, yeah, that's a great question also, and very intuitive. Uh, and and, it's, and as, as I said, it's mostly based on uh, clinical evidence. So great for, um, uh, great in comparison with other outcomes. For example, as I said, pressure, pressure related uh, issues. And when I say pressure related issues are pressure related issues physically and mentally. Mm -hmm. So that's why I love that word pressure <laughs> because it's that idea of lesser stress, lesser stress for the body and lesser stress for the mind. So um, a stress incontinence, a prolapse, especially bladder prolapse and and, and and once we go back, that gets a little bit harder. If, for example, we don't we don't have much data on in, in thero, in thero cells and erectile cells. But on the other side, when there are problems with constipation, another pressure <laughs> a issue, there are great outcomes also. Which makes sense because Trista was talking about digestion potentially, and it just makes sense from a, you're getting, you're getting into the autonomic and parasympathetic types of systems and the nervous system movement there, specifically in those areas. So and it makes sense. movement with the yeah. breathing and the suction. <laughs> yeah, it does. It, the hypothesis makes sense for sure. But, and the, yeah. the one thing that's nice about it is it complements any other exercise program that you're doing and it mm -hmm. offers a balance or counterbalance. So we're not saying that don't do CrossFit, don't do Pilates, don't do this. This is the only answer. No, we're offering you a complement to the other forms of exercise or the activities that you like to do. So you can also um, gain the benefits from this technique mm -hmm. for that exercise program and vice versa. Yes? Yeah. So it offers a nice compliment for, for other exercise programs as well. And I, I agree with what you're saying. There's a lot of techniques that are out there. Mm -hmm. Many of them have proven successful to many women or many men get great results with those techniques. This is another technique that, again, another part of the population is going to be like, oh my God, this makes so much sense. I want to try this. They try it. They like it. It resonates well with them. But we're not, don't make a blanket statement like everybody should do this. Although maybe secretly we think so, but, well, but everybody <laughs> should exercise. <laughs> exercise, <laughs> movement. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I'm saying, I'm saying that there's, you know, there, there's many techniques out there. And this one definitely, uh, of course, we love it. We're passionate about it. It's what we do. And it's what I got such great results with. So, um, I speak passionately about it, but it yes. does offer a nice compliment to other, to other forms of exercise and training as well. And, and especially it complements very well with the high intensity activities because it counterbalance high with low. So for example, Trista loves running. I love strength training, which are a high intensity or high pressure exercises. And just the sensation of then adding your 30 minutes or your a, a cool down with low pressure, it's just that sensation of release and, mm -hmm. and going back into your body and it's stretching. And I, it's just that whenever you, you it's, it's like an addiction, whenever you begin feeling that, that is stretch and that inner stre the left, stretch, yeah. you just want to do it. It's, it's <laughs> true. It is, it is kind of addictive. And it's helped me run better because I love to run. 
-hmm. So now I can run because I do this exercise technique. But not only that, I can breathe better while I'm running and I can power my muscles better while I'm running and I re can recover better because my circulation is then better post-run, post-exercise. And there's, um, there's a really nice mindfulness component that I think um, is a huge piece. And yeah, a mindfulness component with an intensity to it almost, mm -hmm. you know, but it really makes you focus and yeah. So this and is exactly why we've been so curious to at least, you know, like we said, we, we are bringing this, these courses to Pelvic Guru Academy for the purpose of people being able to experience it and really learn firsthand about it versus just seeing some little blips here and there on social media or seeing a video. We really wanted people to be able to experience it. So that's exactly why we wanted to come on today to at least, you know, dispel some of the myths or maybe get a little bit more understanding. I mean, for me, you know, if it took away wrinkles, I, then I'm even more excited. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, I don't but, know if I can make that claim. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I would hope not. But um, I would probably call you out on that if you did. But, um, but I do think it's important to know that the reason why we're doing these courses is because we want people to experience it and learn. And then you can also make your informed decision. And I think that it has been fair to say that the research, there is research there and you can look at it and, and, we're looking at more research coming out. Um, I actually was helping someone with a research project the other day about some ideas for it as well um, in terms of things to, to, to compare it against. So there are some control groups as well. Um, but it's tricky because it's, again, it's not just one exercise. So it'd be picking a few exercises from each type of category of exercise. Um, but I um, also want to say something yeah. about the research that we have to encourage people to do research because people, people say there's no research, but nobody's willing to do it. And yeah. it's a women's health issue because it, women's health issue hasn't been studied, nothing. Nobody cares about endometriosis, interstitial size. So mm -hmm. how is somebody gonna care about something that, is not, that you're not gonna sell, that is an exercise program? So right. we really encourage people to, to do research. We need it. And especially with something that is so unknown like this. Yeah, that's great. So we do have to go. We're actually, believe it or not, this is, I've got them for the whole night. They don't even know I've got more <laughs> interviews coming on. We're actually going to go into the GFAM group now in a few minutes. And we're doing a deeper dive. Even you thought this was deeper. We're going, we're going to go even deeper and do some more answers and things there. So if you are a GFAM member, um, you'll go ahead and go in that group in a few minutes. We are also dropping information about, we're offering, I think it's like 10% off of the course, um, the two courses. Um, it's just for 48 hours. It's the one in Orlando and the one in Portland. We're going to be dropping that information here. And then um, if you're in GFAM, we're offering a little bit more of a discount as well. So if you're interested in, and we'll drop that when we go into that um, group. But I'm going to ask one more question. There's so many good questions i mean we, we could be here for a long um i somewhat of mike let me see if i can find mike's group um questioning again it's still here um let's see let's see i saw it and now it is gone um let's see here mike mike o'neill when hyperpressive breathing specifically allowing the ribs to expand are you supposed to be able to keep your stomach muscles relaxed Someone years ago had me doing a belly breathing, keeping my ribs pinned down. So just in general, or, yeah, I don't know. Great question. Great. That's one of the, the first mistakes when people are learning the, the rib cage opening, that they try to open their ribs and contract at the same time. So if you really want to help to open the rib cage, you have to relax your abdominal muscles. And, that, and, and then they will uh, draw in, but because of the a respiratory muscle contraction. So just relax on the floor, breathe in, breathe out, and just try to feel how you expand progressively your rib cage, feeling how your abdomen is relaxed. We just know it. If you contract your abdomen, your ribs are gonna close. So in order to allow them to open, Relax, 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 okay? Very good. All right. Well, that's a good way for everyone to relax. And I couldn't help. I started trying to do it here. Um, <laughs> so thank you all. We're going to sign off here. And if you are, like I said, if you're a member of GFAM, you can go ahead and head on over there or you can certainly sign up. We are, by the way, this is going to be recorded. Sorry, it's recorded. It will be kept here. 
in the group. So you will be able to get access to this again. And then, like I said, we'll be going over to the other group. Um, so thank you all. I wish, like I said, I wish we could even stay longer. Um, I know Lindsay just dropped some information about the courses we're hosting with this. And if you have any more questions, you can certainly still ask in here and we, you know, we can try to hand, handle some of them. Um, I can't guarantee every single one, but we will try. Um, so thank you all so much and we will be signing off, okay?